Well, hello there. So you might notice that this is not my normal setup. It's not the backdrop. It's not my other bookshelf. It is a, a mess in the dark. Right now, my apartment is an entire mess that you can't see. My entire closet right here is on the bed that's over there because everything is broken. But I'm still trying to film a video for you. If you can't tell by the fact that I'm wearing a wig and in front of a bookshelf, it's a D&D video! Wow! Yay! Cue the children's sound effects! Usually I try to pair what I'm wearing with the D&D &D character or something that I'm talking about, barring the Hamilton video in which I own nothing. <gasps> Segway to the fact that I have nothing to wear for this one either! Yay! <laughs> the closest I can get is the green that's in this wig, if you can see it. And fun fact! I made the green roots in this wig myself. I followed a tutorial by Alexis Paletti about how to like root your wigs and it was awesome and I did it for a barrel makeup costume tutorial quite a few years ago which you can go check out somewhere around here. Probably the iCard or iCard or what have you. and see what that's like. But if you like Rick and Morty, and if you like D&D, well I found a video for you. For Casey's birthday, he wanted to DM a D&D &D campaign. And it was awesome. And so for that, I had to make a D&D &D character set in the Rick and Morty universe. If you didn't know, Rick and Morty did have some D&D &D book things come out, or comic books rather, but they don't really give you stats for different things. So I had to kind of finagle and homebrew and source on the internet everything to make my character what I wanted her to be. So what kind of character did I play for Rick and Morty D&D? Well, let me tell you. I played a Crutobulin, you know, the warriors with the really long heads and the extra extremities, I guess is the YouTube safe way to say that. Act I actually played a Crutobulin human hybrid, you know, half, half, a hybrid. Her name is Carrie. Uh, if you happen to know Pretty Girl Rock by Carrie Hilson, uh, you might understand the personality of Carrie, the warrior princess, the earth pop lover. <laughs> Carrie, as a human crutobulin hybrid, has like a mix of skin tones, and so she has part of her that looks like human and part of her that looks like crutobulin. So she has the elongated head, but she has hair, unlike the rest of them, that's, <gasps> guess what? Green. And she wears it in a high Ariana Grande ponytail. Because she is obsessed with er Earth pop music. <laughs> Why, you might ask? Well, Carrie's only ever been to Earth once when she was a very, very young tyke, so given the way that Crutobulin's age was about two years ago, despite the fact that now she looks a bit more like she's like 18, 19, because Carrie's mother is Kiara, the Crutobulin warrior priestess who visited Earth in one of the Rick and Morty episodes. You may remember her. She looked like this, and she kinda dated Jerry. As you might be able to insinuate from this story, Carrie is the illegitimate daughter of Kiara and Jerry. Carrie! My thought process was, one, it would be funny to see Carrie interact with Morty or Summer or Rick given the history with Kiara and the fact that she would be Morty and Summer's half-sister as well as the fact that if she ever met Jerry, she didn't know that was her father. She was just told that her father was, you know, a brave warrior of the dominant species of man on Earth called the Man-Child, which, depending on how you want to define truth, is true. I also thought that anytime she crit failed anything, it would be her pulling a Jerry, where it was her Jerry DNA that broke in and just made everything suck. She also had a hard time on her home planet where, you know, people thought she was cool and exotic because they're a very kind of hyper-sexual race, but they also thought she was weak because she was human, and humans are, they're like a prey species for the most part, and so she kind of had a find the balance between people thinking she was cool and like a novelty and people thinking that she was just like 
worthless and an abomination and it kind of personified into a overly confident, outwardly confident person that really breaks down very easy because she, she's like, life is so hard, but think of Ariana. Here's a deep cut. If you ever watched RuPaul's Drag Race and you saw the interesting season that's the current season right now, which is season 11, and they did the like worshiping a pop star, think like that. As well as just like a semi-Arthur Weasley kind of thing where she thinks she knows everything about Earth but she really doesn't but she's fascinated by it. Now that you understand who Carrie is as a person or crutobulant or just you know a character let's get into her stats and her build. So Carrie is a battle mage. I will link the homebrew that I used as a reference for this in the description below as well as the reference for the psychic because the Cretobulans are partly psychic, so she needed to have a easily, readily usable kind of telekinesis to lift things or lift herself and all that kind of thing. So as a cantrip, she does have telekinesis, and I worked with the DM, and so she can lift a, about her weight worth of objects. Anything more than that, and it would cost a spell. I really like playing magic users, so I didn't want to just play a straight fighter, and we already had a fighter in the party. So we did Battle Mage, where she is really great with weapons, so she had a staff, kind of like a Gandalf staff, but with the crystal at the top to help her cast magic, so it wasn't a natural magic, so she still fit the human crutobulin thing, she wasn't like the second coming of magic, but the staff helped her cast magic. So the Battle Mage used the weaponry skills a bit of a fighter with the magic of a sorcerer. So. Uh, if you look at the build that I used, it was pretty decent for what I wanted. From what I understand, it's a little bit more like a 4th edition kind of thing, but I am mostly familiar with 5th edition and thus have no real thing to say about 4th edition and what their classes were at all. <laughs> Carrie had the staff and so she could bludgeon people with it. It did 1d6 so we used the staff of a quarter staff for the full staff and you could do like 1d8 if you use both hands just to go whack. And it did bludgeoning damage. Otherwise, she could cast any spell that she needed from that. So she had things like Poison Spray, Fire Bolt. I had to kind of switch up the build because our, D our, our wonderful DM decided to make everything in the campaign poison resistant without telling me. Uh, it was pretty much that. For the most part, she only ever used uh, during the game that we had, which was a one shot, she only really used her Telekinesis and Fire Bolt. Otherwise, her stats went pretty much like a sorcerer. Though, as a battle mage, she got magic resistance at level 3, which is the level that we played at for this campaign, this one-shot campaign. Once she reached level 3, she was semi-resistant to magical spells and being charmed. Which I'm now realizing should have given me an advantage in part of it, but you know what? It's fine. When you roll a character, here's the thing. I've learned that many people have different ways of wanting to roll characters. The way I've always done it, and the way that we did it mainly for everyone who had to have their character built for this campaign that didn't know how to build it themselves. I roll a d20, I roll out all the stat numbers, and then I assign them as I need them. That way you can still assign your highest stat to be whatever your spell modifier is. Mine was intelligence. I was very, very, very smart. Sort of. Though I got the one bad stat, which was Charisma, which again, screwed me over royally. But it fits with the Crutobulans, who are very much like blunt, in-your-face people. It was a little bit of trickery, but for the most part, they say it like it is. And so she had a negative one Charisma. But aside from that, I use a d20, assign all the stats. Some people like to use other dice, whether it's a d10 or a d12 or whatever and assign stats that way, that, but, I think it depends. Yes, your characters can get a little overpowered if you use a d20, but, especially for a campaign that's just going to be a one-shot, which this one was for this game, I really do think that having a d20 helps because you get a little bit more oomph for your one time playing that character. You, you don't really want to be squishy on a campaign that's only gonna last one thing. If you die right away, you're either rolling a new character or you're out of the game for the whole time, and it's not so fun. And you also, and it's why I recommended that we start at third level because it's where all the fun stuff starts to happen and you're not just like, I used all my spells, long rest. I used all my spells, long rest. 
I used all my spells. Long rest. Because it, it's not as fun that way. I have her character sheet right here. She is chaotic neutral with an armor class of 16 with 47 hit points because the build that I found for the battle mage used a D... uses a D10 to roll your stats, which um, I really like because I like not having to die right away. So I ended up with a proficiency in Arcana, Insight, Intimidation, and Acrobatics. And so that, to me, with this character, it really works out with the fact that she's like the only person that can do magic because she has like the special staff of her race. Of her race, she's one of the only people who can do magic, so Arcana felt right because it would say that she studied it, that it was on purpose that she learned this, and it wasn't just some like mystical given thing. I assume that Carrie just wants to do like really amazing things because she wants to prove that she's really freaking amazing. And then you had acrobatics, which I thought was really good because you know the Kajabians go all around. They do the fights, they do the funky things, they do the flips, they do this and that and this. It, it fit to me. Insight because I like trying to like suss out people and like when we're having conversations I really want to be the one to be like I don't trust you. What? And then the fact that she's like a warrior race and she's a part of a race that's known for being scary and going off and murdering things, I figured intimidation was a really good fit because she can't charm people. She's not charismatic at all. Again, negative one modifier for charisma, but she can intimidate people because she's a badass and by the end of the campaign had a Spider Fang Rave Bra. Mm -hmm. Things happen in D&D. We also each all got a specialty skill and for Carrie it was the I understood that reference. Inspiration. So since she loves all things Earth, the I understood that reference inspiration is a call out to Captain America where he's like I understood that reference. And so anytime she understands a Earth thing or a reference that gets thrown out because, you know, Rick and Morty is very, very pop cult is very pop culture heavy, that she would get what is pretty much a bardic inspiration of a 1D6 and just get a little oomph for the flavor. Okay. So for our campaign we did a thing where we did the get the seeds, shove them up, and try to get them through the airport and had a lovely time of me going around to all the shops and charming all the people just with my pure two-year-old, 16-year-old charisma that didn't exist. I was very lucky that the main person that I had to charm was a fish man who ran a space GNC and really didn't want to get, you know, caught for giving stuff to the underage child that was the teenager in front of him and I ended up on a fetch quest doing that. That was the main help I provided and I got a broken Mr. Meeseeks box which helped a little bit. I wasn't as helpful as the actual Mr. Meeseeks but you know I understand Mr. Meeseeks could have gone a crazy way maybe next time. And we only got a little bit in this one shot of Morty realizing that the you know hot alien lady that he hit on in the very beginning was his half-sister and freaking out about that and we did the uh, scene where all the parasites pop up and make you think that you knew them and all the memories and stuff which is where I failed because we had to charisma save everything and I have again a negative one charisma I ended up kind of failing that entire thing and just seeing flashbacks of myself at my birth with Jerry and people being like WTF your dad is Jerry? Yes Apparently he is. As for a one shot, I think this was a good build. I would probably change a little bit and, you know, tweak everything to make her fit more the persona that I felt coming out by the end of the one shot. We do plan on trying to do like a streaming thing of Rick and Morty with a longer campaign with a bunch of us that continuously play and all that and Carrie will make a return should that happen. And of course I will let you guys know if any kind of streaming thing pops up because I assume if you've made it all the way through this video you like D&D, you like Rick and Morty, and hey maybe you like me or Carrie. 
and he was good. I felt a little bit of Carrie coming out, you know, she got the ponytail, she do the hair flip. Oh, that should be my special weapon, you know, a, a whip of the hair, and probably only do like a 1d4 damage, but you know, if you've ever been whipped by a ponytail, it, it stings a little, or a lot, especially if it gets you in the eyes. Well, there you have it. That's how I built Carrie, the half Kutabulan, half human, Kiara, Jerry mess that I played in our Rick and Morty D&D one shot. Hopefully she lives to see another day. And if she does, again, I will let you know. But in the meantime, I will see you, well, not see you, you'll see me next time. Goodbye. Click the box to the right to see how to build some Steven Universe characters in D&D. Or if you're super excited for Game of Thrones final season, click the box to the left to see how you build a Game of Thrones character in D&D. Make sure you don't miss anything by subscribing and I hope that you will come back again soon.